Welcome everybody, this is message number three, and um, we're going to take up a vitally important subject today. Uh, it's biblical reasons for unanswered prayer. That's our, that's our subject for message number three. Um, what reasons does the scripture give that um, for a, a life that where we don't see the answers to prayer that God wants um, a Christian to have in his life? Like the, the author in scripture said, I love the Lord because he has heard my supplication. And um, anybody that's seen answer to prayers in their life could echo that. Um, There's it, it hardly anything more encouraging in the Christian life than, than being able to pray and watch the omnipotent hand of God reach down out of the heavens and do something that only He could do. If it's just subtle and quiet and you're the only one that knows, or if it's blatant and open and obvious, like, like, um, like in the Gospels it says, um, pray, pray in secret and your Heavenly Father will reward you openly. So whatever it is... Um, and man, there's hardly anything more joyful than answered prayer in the Christian life. And um, so we must understand what God has said about the biblical reasons for unanswered prayer. So to start, let's look at John 15, if you would, in your Bibles. John chapter 15, and we are going to start reading in verse number 9. This will be kind of our, our foundational passage, at least our launch pad uh, for this topical study through the Word of God. So John 15, verse number 9, says this, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you that you love one another. So I want to pray here in just a moment. Um, yeah, let's just do that. Father, we desperately need you. I desperately need you. Um, Lord, there's a bit of an agony in my soul. I hunger and ache for the people of God to, to know you. I hunger and ache for the people of God to come into what you have for them in this glorious subject of prayer. I long for the people of God to... Um, yield to you, to allow you to guide them into all that is biblical. That's my prayer in Christ's name, that you would guide every Christian into all that is biblical, that you would protect us from what is not, that you would give clear understanding by grace, that the Spirit of God would open eyes, open ears, illuminate the Word of God, that the Spirit of God would do exactly what you, Lord Jesus, said that he would do. Guide us into all truth. Father, I just pray, please, that you would make this clear. Please work in hearts for the glory of your great name and for the good of your much-loved people. Father, I, I roll the burden onto you. Lord, that song has been such a blessing to me recently. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. And so we need you. We're children of weakness. I'm a child of weakness. Lord, we, we look to you for everything that we need in this time. Yeah, in Christ's name, amen. So even before point one, um, let's just look just briefly. Uh, I hope you all have open Bibles sitting there. 
let's just look briefly at what God says in this passage. Um, he says, as the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Remain in my love. Stay in my love. And I'm going to go ahead and say this. At the end of the passage that we read, there's this beautiful phrase that I want you to notice. In fact, underline it, circle it, star it, highlight it. Um, I mean, somehow, please don't let this pass you by. At the end of the passage, it says that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. That is the will of God. Answered prayer in your life, every Christian, answered prayer in your life is the will of God. If you're falling short of that, if you're recognizing that, that doesn't, your life doesn't look like that, then would you please just say, Lord, I just, I just want for your glory I yield, I submit, I, I see in such beautiful simplicity in the word of God, I see that answered prayer is the will of God. And I want you to lead me into this. I want you to teach me. You know, there's a beautiful life-changing truth that's so simple. And yet the Lord showed me in the past couple months, I can believe God for all of his will in my life. How simple is that? I can believe God for all of his will in my life. He's committed to his will. As I submit to him, as I obey him, as I walk with him every day, I can believe him for what he wants in my life. Answered prayer. In fact, I would even say this, a vital life of constant communion with God. A vital life of fighting battles in prayer. A vital life of asking and receiving, learning what it means to ask and seek and knock, a vital life of mind-blowing relationship with Christ is the will of God. And so I can believe him for that. You can believe him for that. It's amazing. So he says, as the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Stay in my love. Remain in my love. Stay in the place where I love you. And what I want to start out with is not just saying that answered prayer is the will of God, but I want to highlight that this is the context in which that instruction comes or that promise comes. And so the promise here that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you, that comes to the person who's abiding. And if you, it, it is not my purpose to go expositionally through this. But if you were to walk down through this passage, what does it mean to abide? It means to obey. Why does he say he wants them to obey? Because their joy, the, he wants his joy to remain in them and their joy to be full. Um, what is the commandment? That they love one another. Um, and you just keep going. Um, a yielded life. Lay down your life for your friends. Um, he, he takes us into his counsel as we abide with him and we, we end up knowing things. He shares his mind and his heart with us. Um, we end up with a fruitful life in verse number 16. But my real point is this, that to the one who abides in the vine goes out this promise, whatever you ask the Father. That is unbelievably awesome. That promise is unbelievably awesome awesome whatever you ask the father but it's to the one who abides and then we're going to spend the rest of our time during this this um, message looking at clear instruction from the word of God at reasons why he chooses not to hear not to answer he has made himself so clear we have everything we need for life and godliness and even though I'm not there I'll say amen <laughs> and I'll trust that you said amen um, we have everything we need. He's made himself so clear. So let's look, let's look at what he's said. So to the abider goes this promise. Um, you abide in me. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. So I have five simple points that I want to look at today from the Word of God. Um, point number one, um, for biblical reasons that the Lord does not answer prayer is sin simply sin. Point number one is sin. Turn to Psalm 66, if you would. Psalm 66. And we'll look at our first verse here. Psalm 66 
in verse number 18. It says this, Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. In other words, if I hold on to iniquity in my heart, if I refuse to confess, to agree with God about the iniquity in my heart, if I, through anger, through bitterness, through lust, through whatever, if I, if I refuse either um, actively or passively to deal with sin the way God demands sin be dealt with, to hate evil, you who love the Lord, if I refuse the life of holiness that we're called into, be holy as he is holy, as I am holy, says the Lord. If I refuse that, the Lord says he will not hear. That's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. To the person that regards iniquity in their heart, that chooses a compromised Christian life, that will not allow the Lord to work in them forgiveness, whatever it is. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Um, turn to the right, if you would, to Proverbs 28. There's a beautiful one here. Proverbs chapter 28. And verse number 9. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. So the Lord begins to lay this foundation biblically that if you refuse to listen to me um, as an act of judgment, I refuse to listen to you. This, of course, in a believer's life would be temporary judgment. Um, and we'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. Uh, there's one, um, I'm not going to turn to this one, but Isaiah 59 says, Your sins have made a separation between you and your God. That's Isaiah 59 two. Your sins have made a separation between you and your God. And then do turn to Jeremiah 11. This one is very instructive and very, again, very straightforward. You know, there's others that we could turn to as well. Um, but I just want to lay a foundation that this is a clear, consistent testimony in the word of God. Jeremiah chapter 11 and verse number 10. Jeremiah 11.10. It says, they have turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my word and they have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will surely bring calamity on them, which they will not be able to escape. And then please catch this. And though they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. So basically he says, if you refuse to hear my words, I refuse to hear your words as an act of judgment. And until you come back to the place where you humbly, you know the word obey in the Hebrew, it means to hear under. So until you come back to the place where you yield, you hear under God, rather than be like Satan in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, where he says, I will lift myself up. I will be equal to the Most High, right? That's the rebellion is, is putting yourself alongside God. Submission is hearing under, or obedience is hearing under. And so he says, if you, if you refuse to come back to the place where you will hear and put yourself under my word, then um, I, as an act of judgment, will refuse to hear you. And so simple sin is, um, really it's the biggie. And in fact, I have five points, but, but in a sense, you could put the subsequent points under this category of, of sin. Sin always separates, both eternally and temporally, both judicially and parentally. So, so um, let's just look at that for just a second. Um, why did Jesus Christ die on the cross? So that mankind could be reconciled to God, right? Sin, sin separated. All ye like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned to your own way. Um, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Um, the wages of sin is death, separation. 
And so it's true eternally, it's true judicially, that our sins separated us from God. But it's also true parentally. If we took the time to look at John 13 in the New Testament, um, the Lord Jesus says to them, you are clean. Um, Peter, of course, in his zeal, he says, don't just wash my feet, wash all of me. And he says, he says, you only need to be bathed once, right? You don't need to be bathed again. But if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me, no intimacy with me, no fellowship with me. And so the same thing is true judicially and parentally. The same thing is true eternally and temporally that sin always separates. And so this is absolutely the huge one in, in the Word of God. We must live a yielded life. We must live a holy life. Um, let me please say to the best of my ability here that this is by grace. The child of God lives his life in an atmosphere of grace. We live in an ocean surrounded by limitless grace. When sin increases, grace mega increases or hyper increases. It increases all the more. And so all of that, what I'm saying, I'm intending to communicate this in an atmosphere of grace. And yet I have to be fair with the word of God that, that even in an atmosphere of grace, as an act of discipline, right? Hebrews, he disciplines those whom he loves. Um, it's actually a sign of sonship to be disciplined by God. As an act of discipline, um, he refuses to listen to those that refuse to hear under. It's, it's, it's one way he's clearly chosen to relate to us. So, sin. Now, I would like to take just a second to think, think about this on two different levels. Um, oftentimes, when you say sin, people think of commission or committing a sin. And I want to think both about committing sins, but also the sins of omission. I wonder sometimes if there are more sins of omission that are really killing people's prayer lives than there are commission, really. So let's just think about that just, just for a second. One thing that stood out to me, I think I mentioned this last week, if I remember correctly, but one thing that has really stood out to me over these past years is that when you read the list of sins in Scripture, um, it's shocking to me how often they fall into two categories. And I would call those moral sins and social sins. And so if you, this is definitely true of the list of sins in Colossians and Galatians. And we could keep going, and I'm not going to. But, but you, you see it typically starts out with things like fornication, adultery, an unclean mind, sexual immorality. It'll start listing things like, like that, idolatry. Um, and then at some point, it will shift to what I would refer to as, as moral, as, um, sorry, social sins, selfishness, bitterness, anger, clamor, um, selfish interests, um, speaking down, um, talking down, speaking evil. Um, it's more the, the social sins. And man, we need to take both of those things. And I'm talking about committing sins, but what, boy, do we need to take both of those things so 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 seriously um yeah it cuts us off from intimacy with god it cuts us off from a proper prayer life and and if you want biblical authority for that just go right back to where we started john chapter 15 the promise in that passage is to the one who abides and sin hinders fellowship between the child of god and god it doesn't cut off the judicial eternal relationship but it hinders fellowship, it hinders intimacy, and um, a proper prayer life flows out of a proper living, breathing, abiding relationship between a child of God and, and the God that he loves. So, so please, um, definitely think about sins of commission. Now, I want to spend even more time looking at this idea of sins of omission, things that we're commanded to do in the Word of God that we don't do, and it has devastating consequences in our, in our prayer life. So think with me. I'm not going to turn to these passages, um, but please think with me about um, like Jeremiah 2. It says, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have turned to broken cisterns, um, cisterns that do not satisfy, he says there. And um, so please think, um, 
My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me. That word forsaken could also be translated neglected. It's the idea of not treating the Lord how he deserves to be treated, not giving him the place in your life that he deserves to have in your life. If Jesus Christ is truly Lord, then what that means is we should start with a blank piece of paper. Right across the top, we put Jesus Christ is Lord. And whatever that means for the rest of our life, it, 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 he must be preeminent. We must approach him in this way. And yet, as good Westerners, we so often think, oh, I just wish I had more time. And, and we make excuses for not treating God the way he deserves. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man opens the door, I will come in to him, fellowship with him, sup with him, and he with me. So often we think, oh, I wish I had more time. And it's really, it's really a sin of, of omission. Um, I'm talking about myself. Um, I have lived a Christian life where I have been a serial neglector of the quiet, intimate place with him. In fact, I really didn't even pay much attention to it. I was so fascinated and taken up with service and I was so busy for God that I didn't live a Christ-like life. I, I got the part of Christ-likeness where you work hard, be steadfast and movable, abounding in the work of the Lord. And that's good. Praise God. Those things are good. But I didn't get the part of Christ's likeness that's described in John 15 and many other beautiful passages in Scripture where he says that abide in the vine and you'll bear much fruit. And so I had this version where I was working, 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 but I was totally missing out on this intimacy. And I wondered, why is there a lack of power in my life? Why can't I love my wife the way Christ loves the church? Why do I struggle with impatience with my kids? I used to wonder all these things. Why did sin seem so powerful and unovercomable in my life? Now I look back and I think it's because I wasn't living the Christian life the proper way. It was a sin of omission, if you want to put it that way. I was refusing to let the Spirit of God lead me into all that is biblical, all that He wants for me for the glory of Christ. Yeah, so Jeremiah 2, um, what I called normal, God calls evil. Man, that's pretty serious. Why didn't I have a more vital prayer life? I was refusing the life, the Christian life that the Lord had for me. Malachi 1 and 3, as an example, um, he, says, he says, you give to me the, lime, the lame, the blind. Um, they were still giving to God, but they weren't giving God the first and the best. That is so shocking. He says, try that with your own governors. If I'm a father, where is my reverence? If I'm a king, where is my honor? If we're not giving to the Lord the first and the best of our life, it's a sin of omission in that sense. And we'll never come into all that he wants for us. If we're not yielded, if we're not in obedience. John 15, we already looked at, abide in the vine. It's to that person, abide in my love. It's to that person that he says, ask whatever of the Father and he will give it to you. Oh, that's amazing. Ask whatever. 1 Peter 3, 7. This one's so important. Um, flip there if you would. 1 Peter 3, 7. This is vitally important. In fact, this is my favorite verse in all the word of God to husbands, specifically to husbands. I'd love to take an hour and unpack all the beauty and the detail of this verse. 1 Peter 3, 7, just, just as a brief little warning here from the Word of God. It says, Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, that in the Greek means house together, with understanding, it's comprehensive knowledge, you're supposed to study your wife, you're supposed to know your wife, giving honor to the wife, that means to treat her as precious, that, that root word, um, honor, um, is used repeatedly in the book of First Peter. It means to treat as precious. So give honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. So this describes the way a husband needs to treat his wife so gently, like a beautiful rose. Needs to care for her. 
needs to not be harsh with her. Another another passage that I hope you guys are all familiar with would say. He needs to love her. He needs to honor her. And if he doesn't, it says that your prayers may not be, that's a powerful word, hindered. That word hindered, it, it um, means to be cut off or destroyed. The same word is used in Romans 15 where the Apostle Paul says, I often long to come to you, um, but I was hindered. And so Paul says, I wanted to get from where I am to where you are. I wanted to get through to you, but something cut off my desire. Something, something thwarted my desire. Something destroyed my plans. I couldn't get from where I am to where you are. And then you think of that in the context of prayer, right? Basically, he's saying that if you don't treat your wife the right way, your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. How many sincere, godly men have hindered prayer lives because they don't treat their wife the right way? Can I, can I confess something? I frequently don't treat my wife the right way. I, I, and I'm not saying I'm a hypocrite. I'm not saying I have some secret life. I don't mean that at all. But more frequently than I wish, I'll just say something with a sharp edge. And she knows. She picks up on it instantly. That's the opposite of what it says in 1 Peter. It's the opposite of treating her as precious, treating her as a co-heir of the grace of life knowing her and loving her and housing together in love and understanding. Now, I'm not randomly confessing this to you. I have a point. My point is this. Without the grace of God, I would have an utterly hindered prayer life. But when I fall short, if I fall short, to use the language of 1 John, I must confess that means to speak with the same words, to agree. So I must confess to God about what I did. And then I must confess to my wife and ask for forgiveness. When sin increases, grace increases all the more. God help me if I ever pre preached some form of legalism. Like you're going to make this happen in your own power. What I'm saying is simple. A life of answered prayer is the will of God. If you'll submit and follow, this is what he'll lead you into. It's all based on an ocean of grace that you're surrounded with as a child of God. The Christian life begins with grace. It carries on with grace. Romans 5. Without grace, where would we be? So can I please just say to husbands, um, think it through, guys, please. If the, Lord, if the Lord shows you anything, I don't care if it's small, if it's big, anything, just go and ask for forgiveness of God and of your wife. It's too important not to have a proper prayer life. So one of the sins of omission is just not treating your wife the right way. Um, we could keep going, but I just want you to see, I'm going to stop here. I just want you to see I want us all to see um, just the testimony of God across the scriptures that, that he says, um, if you regard iniquity in your heart, I will not hear you. Your sins have made a separation between you and your God. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer will be an abomination. That applies to both sins of commission and, and a refusal to submit or to yield to the Lordship of Christ. And so sins of omission. I've suffered horrifically because of sins of omission. I can vividly remember in high school the Lord drawing me to my Bible and I would go outside and hit golf balls around in the front yard or go for a run or go play football or or many times go off and serve the Lord in some way. But But that was a huge sin of neglect in my life. Not just my Bible, but my personal quiet place with Christ. Anyways, I'm not going to belabor the point, but I just want that testimony to be to be so clear. 
Um, the number one point for um, hindered prayer in a Christian's life is sin. Number two, go to James chapter one, if you would, in your Bibles. James chapter one in your Bibles. This would be point number two, um, and it would be doubting. So the second biblical reason for hindered prayer in a Christian's life would be doubting or not asking in faith. So James chapter one, verse number six says this. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. He who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For not let, or excuse me, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. For he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. So, Okay, so point number two, it teaches us to ask in faith with no doubting. Um, what does that mean? What would that look like? It's, it's asking in faith in the goodness of God. Um, it's asking in faith in the power of God that he can do these things. Um, it's asking in faith in the willingness of God. Um, there are people that I, that I hold to be very precious in my life. Um, I have zero doubt of their place in the family of God. Um, and yet, a lifetime of seeing very little or no answered prayer has led them to the conclusion that that God lives way out there and, and that um, he's really not that involved in day-to-day -day life here. That is so tragic and that it is so, it is so uh, robbing. That is a, a, a fact, or I don't want to use that term, that is a thought that robs God of so much glory to think it's almost deistic, right? That he exists, that he created the world, but he lives way out there. And um, where the Lord says, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you for everyone that asks receives. And on and on and on. So we need to ask with no, without doubting. So that does not mean whatever I want, God will do. It means that I need to ask in full faith and confidence in the will of God. I need to ask in full faith and confidence in the goodness of God in the eagerness of God to answer prayer. One of my favorite verses, really, it goes back to Christ's teaching on prayer again. He uses this little phrase and says, if you then, being evil, give good gifts to your children. That is so amazing. That as much as I love my kids, as much as I would lay down my life for my kids, compared to the infinitely good heart of God, I'm an evil father. That is so amazing. He is so eager to answer our prayers. And that, that's really what it means. Ask in faith with no doubting. Now, there's an element here of being led by the Spirit as well. Sometimes the Spirit of God will choose to lead specifically. Romans chapter 8, His Spirit witnesses to our spirit. Also Romans chapter 8, those that are led by the Spirit are children of God or sons of God. Sometimes the child of God who is yielded, the child of God who has a proper intimate relationship with the Heavenly Father, sometimes the Spirit of God will specifically lead that child to pray in a very unique, specific way. And when he's led, when that child is led, we need to ask in full faith and confidence that, that in the Lord's will. Again, it's not our will, and, um, but it's his will. Yeah, so ask in, without doubting. Point number three in the outline is prayerlessness. What is the third thing, uh, the third biblical reason for hindered prayer? In a, in a Christian life, um, turn one page to the right, if you would, to James chapter 4, and let's see what he says here. James chapter 4 and verse number 2. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Oh, that is devastating. 
It's so clear, isn't it? Who could misunderstand that? Why are the Christians not seeing the answers to prayer in their Christian life? One of the clear reasons is they're not a people of prayer. There's a revival that took place in central Iowa years and years ago. I read the book. It's called The God Awakening. I think it's out of print. I think you'd have a hard time finding it. But the people in the town prayed for 10 years before this revival took place in central Iowa. A revival just took place a year or two ago in North Carolina a localized revival. And I and I read in the article when I was reading about it, and again, um, I don't pretend to understand these things, but it said that, that the, the Baptist ladies in the town had prayed for 10 years for the next move of God. Why do we not see more answered prayer? Well, this is a clear testimony of Scripture. You do not have because you do not ask. So prayerlessness. I just want to say, if I could, as, as humbly as I possibly can, um, prayerlessness is a plague amongst the people of God. I suppose there's a lack of understanding I suppose it's a lack of teaching on some level. I suppose that leaders that aren't men of prayer have set poor examples, starting with me. I suppose there'd be lots of things that are true. But I just want to say that prayerlessness is such a plague amongst the people of God. How do you learn to pray? By praying by obeying, by yielding, by telling the Lord. I mean, this is prayer. Telling the Lord that you want everything that he wants for you. There's someone, they, they've since apologized to me for this. And I deeply, dearly love this person. They told me a couple of years ago that when I first started talking about prayer, when I first started saying things like, we need to have all-night prayer meetings. And we did. We started having all-night prayer meetings and all-day, all-Saturday prayer meetings. And we started praying whenever we could get together. Three-day prayer retreats, whatever. I mean, when we started doing that, he told me several years after that that he really thought I was being legalistic. And when he confessed it to me, he just confessed it as, as immaturity and selfishness, that he had misunderstood the burden that I had before God, that he thought I was somehow putting forward some kind of work that would lead to being a special Christian. Boy, nothing can be farther from the truth. The simple truth, it's hard not to cry. The simple truth is this. I hunger and ache and I long for the people of God to know their God. I long for them to love the Lord their God with all their heart and soul and mind and strength. I long for them to enjoy. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. Or the one that's been the most encouraging to me recently, child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. I want the people of God in Europe. I hunger and I ache for the European bride of Christ to come into all that God has for them in prayer. I don't know another way to say it. That's what God's given me. At times it's torturous. 
At times it's a burden. Um, yeah, I just long for that. And you know why I long for that? Because God's heart longs for that. And he's shared that burden with me. I don't know how that'll come across on a video. But I, that is good news. This is what the living God wants for the European Bride of Christ. What's killing us? Point number three, prayerlessness. Point number four, selfishness. It's in the same passage. Let's just keep going. Uh, James chapter four and verse number three now. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. In other words, you're, you're actually praying now, according to the verse, but you're praying selfishly. You're praying off the mark. That's amiss, right? So if you think of archery, rather than hitting the bullseye, which would be praying in the will of God, um, you're asking for something that's not the will of God. You're asking, in fact, in the context, you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. So obviously in the context, um, it's, it's a selfishness. Um, proper, uh, excuse me, essential to a proper prayer life or fundamental to a proper prayer life is this thought, um, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And please, like, let and ask the Lord to search you and search your prayer life and show you any way that your prayer life is really an assertion of self-will. Um, the Apostle Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. That's the opposite of self-will. He said, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The opposite of self-will. Um, he died with Christ. And then in Corinthians, he says he dies daily. The opposite of self-will. Um, a lot of Christians don't see answered prayers because their prayers um, are an assertion of self-will. If we pray selfishly, the Lord loves us too much to answer those kinds of prayers. He can't reaffirm selfishness in, in one of our lives. Why would a loving, good father ever do that? Feed selfishness. Grow selfishness in our lives. He would never, he would never do that. And he says it right there. Um, you ask and do not receive because... You ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. So point number four would be um, selfishness. Uh, do you remember uh, when Christ was interacting with Peter? He said, you're, you're mindful of the things of men, not the things of God. Do you remember that little phrase? It, it's the same thought. He's saying, Peter, what you're saying it's, it's not what I would say. You're not thinking how I think. Again, last week we talked about spirit-led prayer, right? That's a, such a beautiful teaching of God's word. How do we pray God's thoughts? Well, the spirit of God is the one that knows the mind of God, according to the word of God. So, so as we yield, as we pray, as we are filled with the spirit and then yielded to the spirit, walking in the spirit, and praying in the Spirit, then our prayers are directed and empowered by the Spirit, and we end up praying what God wants. And then he's, His delight is to answer. If we ask anything according to His will, we have what we ask. This is the confidence that we have in Him, 1 John 5. So selfishness is killing the people of God, a lack of willingness to die to self, die to the world. Um, a lack of willingness to have Christ be Lord of all. Yeah, these things kill a proper prayer life. And then I, I have one more. In John chapter 13, the Gospel of John. Turn there with me if you would. John chapter 13. And I hope that this will be, I trust that this will be a real encouragement to some. John chapter 13 and verse number 36. John chapter 13 and verse number 36. This is point five in the outline, reasons for hindered prayers. 
And I'm just going to put it this way. Maybe the, the Lord wants you to wait. Point five, maybe the Lord wants you to wait. In other words, the issue is timing. Sometimes when you ask for something, the salvation of a relative, um, a job promotion, sometimes you're not asking selfishly. Sometimes there's no hindrance of sin. Sometimes the issue is he does want to say yes to that prayer, but you, there's going to be a time of waiting before you see that answer to prayer in your life. We see a beautiful example of that here. John chapter 13, verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Notice that it's all an issue of timing. So, so Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. So Peter was saying, my will is to be where you are. Earlier in this message, we, we looked at an exhortation from John 15, where he says, abide in my love. In John 14, he says, I'm going to come again, that where I am, there you may be also. It is the will of God in that sense for us to be where he is. So the issue is timing in this passage. It's timing. Peter's desire was good. Peter's desire was healthy. Peter's desire was even of God in that sense, but it had to be deferred until it was realized. I hope that that is so, so clear. So, so oftentimes in the Christian life, this is the issue that we see, that the Lord does want to answer your prayer. He is guiding your prayer. He does want you to keep praying. The issue is timing. So verse 38, Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. In other words, Peter, I know you better than you know yourself. And um, I know that you will be with me someday. Um, you will follow me afterward, but you can't follow me now. So sometimes the issue is just the Lord does want to answer the prayer, but he just wants you to wait. So in Daniel chapter 10, um, they prayed, of course. That's a beautiful Daniel 9 and 10, beautiful example of prayer of an intercessor of God's people. Um, he does pray. The answer comes from heaven, and I'm sure you'll remember this. Because of spiritual warfare, the answer was delayed. That's amazing. So, so in that case, the answer was on its way, but there was a battle that was taking place that delayed it arriving um, for that number of that number of days in in the story. So. Um, Point number one in our, in our outline, biblical reasons for hindered prayer, is sin. Um, sin always separates. Point number two, um, asking not in faith or doubting. Point number three, um, prayerlessness, a lack of letting the Lord lead us into a life of prayer. We're not asking, we're not laboring, we're not travailing, we're not letting him guide us into this Christ-like life of prayer. Um, point number four, um, saying my will be done on earth as yours is in heaven, rather than thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So in other words, selfishness in our prayers, things that look good to us, but a lack of death to self. Um, you could even think of like 1 Corinthians 4, where he says you're reigning as kings before the time, right? That's a problem in the human heart. And it leads to hindered prayer lives. And then point number five, maybe um, he's not not answering your prayers. Um, maybe he is waiting to say yes because he's going to get more glory out of it in his perfect time. Because he wants to give you something better than what you're asking for. And his good heart won't settle for less, but wants you to be wants you to be so blessed. You know, I remember um, over twenty years ago. Uh, I was a starving young husband and um, I was away for some reason for a weekend and we needed $50 to pay a bill. And um, I told my wife without even thinking about it, I said, just ask my dad. He'll gladly give you $50. Um, I'll pay him back when I, when I get paid in a couple days. And I knew my dad. My dad would fall all over himself to grant a request like that. And um, so she went, she spent time with my mom and dad 
that day, I called her at the end of the day and said, did you ask my dad? And she said, I just couldn't do it. And I love my wife. I love her sensitivity to the Lord. She said, I just couldn't. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't stomach it. So she said, I prayed. And the crazy thing is it never even occurred to me to pray about something so little, 50 bucks. Um, never occurred to me to pray about it. And um, my wife committed it to the Lord. She went home from uh, my parents' house to her to our house. On the way, she checked our mail at our apartment at the time. And um, a friend from Bible college had written us a note. And the note was a tiny little note. It said simply, um, I heard you had a baby. I've never met a young couple that have a baby that couldn't use $50. <laughs> and so I wanted to send you this little gift. And um, yeah, she just asked. Um, and and the Lord sent it. In fact, the, the answer had already been sent days before. Um, yeah, I just love that. So So let's remember together, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be answered and or the, the door will be opened. For everyone who asks, receives. That's the will of God. You don't have to understand the Christian life totally to live it. You just have to submit and you have to chase Christ. You have to let him lead you every step of the way. Um, all of these things are ours in Christ. Lord, help us to enter into them. Thank you. Thank you.